elite Democrats have decided that they need to figure out who their scapegoat is if Kamala Harris loses this thing. This week, they're taking aim at black men specifically, white men too. Here's Andrea Mitchell. She said it over the weekend. I think it, they've got to double down on doing more interviews and serious interviews because what I'm hearing from Democratic and Republican business people and mm. a lot of men, and she's got such a big problem with men. I mm -hmm. think there's an undercount of the Trump vote. I think there's misogyn misogynation in, in all of this, black and white men. A lot of misogyny among black men and white men. Uh, President Barack Obama echoed that sentiment uh, yesterday as he said he wanted to address the brothers uh, and told them that uh, they need to get over themselves. Opportunities is that um, we have not yet seen the same kinds of energy and turnout in all quarters of our neighborhoods and communities as we saw when I was running. Now, I also want to say that that seems to be more pronounced with the brothers. He went on to say that they needed to get over their sexism and support Kamala. For more on this topic, I want to bring in Delano Squires now. He's a research fellow at the Heritage Foundation and joins us on the phone. Delano, great to have you back with us, sir. Thank you for having me. It does feel like scapegoating. Like they're, they're looking at a struggling campaign and they're saying, who do we blame for this? And this is about right for Democrats. This is, this is the way that they are used to talking to black men. Uh, they did this in 2020. Uh, when even the thought that some small percentage of black men may vote for Trump had Maxie Waters, Jim Clyburn um, out on the stump, you know, chastising these men. One radical f feminist professor named Brittany Cooper said that black men, considering voting for Trump, um, just wanted the power and privilege that white men have. So I I'm not surprised by this. Um, I don't think it's an effective strategy, but it's the strategy we should expect from a party that is controlled by second wave feminists, um, both women and their male allies. It also seems like a dishonest inventory of why Kamala is losing and that rather than figure out what is is failing in her campaign, they're just externalizing the blame. They're just saying, well, it's somebody else's fault. C correct. But I mean, I, I, I don't want to dismiss the notion that some men may feel uncomfortable voting, particularly for a woman on the left, because, again, Anybody with eyes can see that, you know, Democrats only talk about men, and particularly black men, when it's time to vote. And, and anyone who pays attention can see the uh, distinction between how they speak about and speak to black women and how they speak to black men. When they want to campaign for black women, when they want the black female vote, they say, vote for us and we'll make you Katanji Brown Jackson. We'll make you Kamala Harris. We'll make you one of the record number of federal judges we've appointed to the bench. When they speak to black men, if, when they're not chastising them, they say, vote for us or, or your opponent will turn you into George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery or Jacob Blake. So it's, it's never aspiration and inspiration when it comes to black men. It's always shame, insult, guilt, and their need to be right. Yeah, they're selling fear rather than, than uh, something bigger. Uh, so um, what do you make of this cycle and, and how things are changing? It does seem... Uh, like, like at least according to the surveys, the polls, uh, that there is a meaningful shift among especially black men towards Trump. I've, I've seen a lot of data suggesting that young black men are headed in his direction. Why is that? What's happening? I, I think it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I would love to think that the men making that move uh, have their eyes open to Democrats and their top priorities, which I would say top two are by far abortion and anything having to do with sexual orientation and gender identity. I would love to think that guys are saying, look, their values don't align with my values. Uh, my sense is that part of it is just the, um, the aura and pull of Donald Trump as a singular politician. So I I'm cautious to make broader assumptions about what this means for the Republican Party sure. or the conservative movement. Um, I, I, I do think part of it is that Kamala Harris is, has not been the most impressive political candidate. Uh, she finds it difficult to speak with any level of specificity. Um, she, she is not necessarily focusing in on superficial identity, but her surrogates certainly are. And I think a lot of guys are tired of 
you know, vote for this person because they look like you or they sound like you or, you know, this, the type of superficial identity politics that the left is used to practicing. So I, I think it's a mix of things. Uh, but, again, we'll see come, you know, election day where things actually shake out. I, I was struck by the way that Obama made his pitch last night to black men. Uh, he was saying that basically Kamala is one of us was essentially the pitch he made uh, and that she 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 knows the struggle, uh, he said, uh, unlike Donald Trump. And she she came up like we did kind of stuff. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, well, first of all, Obama's experience is pretty un atypical for any American. He was he grew up internationally. Uh, and uh, he, had, he had a white mother, a black father, he, you know, Kamala Harris, uh, once again, another atypical story, not not really sh sharing a common theme with the average black person in America. What what is that pitch? I, I noticed that as well. I was actually talking to my wife about that this morning. Um, it, it doesn't really make sense. You know, Kamala Harris, both of her parents were PhDs. She spent a good amount of her childhood in Canada. So like Obama, not just. Um, not uh, a sort of a black American in terms of longstanding history in this country or descendant of American slavery. So they, they don't share that, but not just that, but to your point, they spent a significant amount of their childhood and informative years in another country. Um, and then when Obama was raised in the United States, he was as far away from a recognizable black narrative as you can get. He didn't grow up in Cleveland or Detroit or, in, in Mississippi or in Harlem or in Chicago. He grew up in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked my wife this morning, I said, do you know any black people from Hawaii? She said, I know one. So <laughs> n neither of these individuals have what I would say would be a recognizable black narrative. But I think there's a more important lesson to be learned from this. Mm -hmm. And it's that superficial identity politics, whether practiced on the left or on the right, mm -hmm. is a loser's game for voters. Because what politicians do, they, they, they find the right resonance, they find the right keywords, and this can be on the right, with politicians who speak fluent Christianese, but who wear a Christian identity as a brand, yeah. not as a set of values and principles, but, but they, they find the right frequency, they speak to voters in that way, and all, and I, I've seen this with Obama, I've seen this with other politicians since him, they end up tr selling out their voters who think they're voting for one thing, right, but end up uh, voting for uh, a policy platform that is not just um, disconnected from their, their needs as voters, but really is far more radical than anything that the voters could have ever thought of. For sure. And, and it seems that, you know, if you look at all of the issues that people care about in this election as they rank them, uh, by and large, they're not actually wrapped up in identity politics unless that identity is being an American. That's that's the only one, uh, because it is economic concerns. It's inflation. It's debt. It's the border. It's illegal immigration. These are concerns that that go across race, color, creed lines, Delano Squires. And uh, that's where the voters seem to be the most interested right now. Absolutely. And, and I fail to say, like, I, I went to college in Pittsburgh. And so I know the city fairly well. And, you know, you're talking about a blue collar working class town. And, and again, I'm sure that the, the, the voters there, including the black ones, are concerned about those pocketbook issues. And, and to your point, I mean, I'm from New York originally, right, the, the child of, of uh, parents who immigrated from the Caribbean. And even my family and my friends are the types of people to say this, this illegal immigration stuff has to stop. Because people who came here legally and who are American citizens and tied to this, to, to this land and want to see the country succeed understand that you can't have an immigration policy that's based in chaos and disorder. It's not good for the country. It's not even good for the people who are coming here. Um, so I, I do think that Americans in general are, have issues that we care about, pocketbook issues, law and order issues. There are issues of culture, but anyone who pays attention to the Democrat Party today, both on a national level and on a local level, in the presidential election and some of the Senate elections, understands that this part, the top thing that they're running on is abortion. It's all they talk about. Every, every campaign stop is, is about abortion. Even in the Maryland Senate race, and I'm, I'm a Maryland resident, a big topic 
from Angela Also Brooks and Larry Hogan was abortion. And court and Vince, excuse me, to, to to tell you how bad it's gotten, even Larry Hogan, who was running as a Republican in the state of Maryland, said that his top priority if he wins office is to codify Roe. So that'll tell you how important abortion is to the left, that even a Republican in a in a in a blue state, sometimes purplish state, yes. feels that he also needs to get on board with that agenda. Okay, let me, since you brought up that topic, I, I'd, I'd love to ask you your thoughts on, on what happens in November and afterwards, uh, depending on who wins. So a smart, a smart person I know just told me this week, he thinks that um, should Trump lose this year, the postmortem on that will be the reason for it was abortion, and the lesson that the establishment Republican Party will take is that our country needs more abortions going forward. Is that your view? I, I believe that it, it, it depends on why President Trump loses, right? If he loses because of a depressed evangelical turnout, then I think the lesson that the party may take and certainly should take is that we should not ignore – our strongest uh, voting bloc and our biggest supporters in order to appeal to people on the left who will never vote for us. And, and maybe it may force the party to do some rethinking about how it messages around some of these culture issues and, and particularly on issues of life and mm -hmm. marriage and family. Mm -hmm. uh, if he wins, d despite let's say, you know, less than enthusiastic turnout from evangelicals, I think what it would do is, cement the Republican Party's sort of remake. I call it the Imago Maga, which is the party would be remade in Trump's image. And I think you will see more Republicans move away from abortion and protection of life um, because to them, they will see this as a signal that you don't have to run on abortion to win a national election. And if you just say, leave it to the states, three exceptions, rape, you know, incest and life of the mother and say, this is what Ronald Reagan favored. You, you can still be competitive in national races. That, that is my analysis. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, what I think will happen in terms of the election result. I'm just saying that is what I anticipate happening if the election goes in one or two ways. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, I, I said, there's an announcement today that President Trump is going to be doing um, an all-women town hall soon on Fox. And I, I don't know how that's going to go, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see, I'm sure. Uh, but one thing I think that all politicians would do well to emphasize is we should decrease the need for abortion. Like, like so let's just say you think that that's an appropriate course of action. Nobody really prefers it. I mean, that's kind of crazy to prefer it. What we should do when 40% when of women say they're getting abortions for financial reasons— we should decrease that, shouldn't we? We should have such a good economy that you don't think that you need to do that, take a life out in order to advance your own. I certainly think there are ways, there are better ways to message. I, I think first and foremost is to talk about abortion and its connection to marriage. 87%, so close to nine out of every 10 women who seek an abortion are unmarried. And, and I think there's an opportunity for conservative politicians to, to frame the issue of life in a larger narrative around a pro-family agenda. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, and I, I think part of that has to do with economics, but at the end of the day, I, I believe that it's a strategic mistake for Republicans to abandon um, the protection of life and abandon the rhetoric around that in an attempt to appeal to more moderate or even more left-leaning voters. I, I don't think any, I don't think Republicans should be ashamed to say, we are the party that believes that all life has inherent value, regardless of the socioeconomic status of the mother or the age yes. or location of the child. Yes. There's nothing wrong with saying that. And in fact, that is the moral position to take. But I understand it may not be the winning position for election, but I don't think we should be scared to, to say what it is that we believe and why we choose to protect life. Yeah, and once you give up uh, defending those values, people don't even know that they should, should take them up. And so there's there's a... This is a really big and important debate. Uh, Delano Squires, I'm so glad you're a part of it. Good to talk to you today, sir. Thank you very much.